إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد we praise Allah تبارك وتعالى abundantly and we ask him to exalt the mention and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in spite of the hating of the haters who have been attacking him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recently during their so-called festivities, their holy or unholy festivities. But that will come soon, inshallah. Now, um, we spoke, or the title of the lecture is The Four Qualities, and I'm sure some of you have managed to kind of figure it out. But um, I will ask a series of rhetorical questions. And by definition, a rhetorical question is a question which is intended to make you reflect you don't have to answer. In fact, do not answer. Because some people get excited and they will give me an answer every time. No, it's just a question. It's an information being presented to make you think. Do not answer the following questions. Just listen attentively. What was the thing which the Sahaba feared the most? Don't answer. What was the thing which the Sahaba feared the most? What was that thing that made Umar رضي الله عنه say to حذيفة أنشدك بالله ألم يسمني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم منهم I beseech Allah and I remind you of Allah in other words did the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم mention me among them what was the thing that made Ibn Abi Milkiya who was one of the tabi'een said as it comes in Bukhari I came across 30 of the companions of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of them feeling for himself that blank. What was it? What is that thing or what is that quality that is worse than mere kufr and will place its possessor in the, in the lowest level of the hellfire? What is that quality that many have while they perceive not. The quality which if a believer feels secure regarding it, in fact suffers from it. And as long as he is worried of having it, it indicates that he is a true believer, as put by Al-Hasan al-Basri, Rahimahullah. What is that thing? Now you can answer. Hypocrisy, good, nifaq in Arabic. Nifaq occurs 31 times in the book of Allah in different derivatives of the word, not necessarily like munafiqeen, munafiqoon, nafaq ila akhirihi, whatever, whatever it comes from the root word. But it occurs 31 times in the book of Allah. And uh, amazingly, if you read Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the first thing that a believer would usually read, you will find that Allah spoke about the believers and He spoke about the kuffar in a couple of ayat and then uh, a few pages are dedicated to the munafiqeen. So there's much more elaboration on, on them than you would find on the believers themselves and the disbelievers in general. Not that that wasn't made up later on in the Quran, but at least in Surah Al-Baqarah, you will see that how Allah Azza wa describes them. Then in Surah At-Tawbah and in many surah of the Quran, there's a surah named after them. All of these surah are meant to expose them. Are meant to expose them. Now, in order to avoid any potential confusion or misunderstanding, it is only right to state that hypocrisy is of two kinds. And it is fundamental that we understand that. Otherwise we get things mixed up. And if you get things mixed up in the matter of the deen, then the people who listen to you will get mixed up as well. And the total result will be chaos 
for the speaker and the listeners, which entails the loss of the ummah at large. If all those who were addressing the people were doing so in such a manner, then we would be in big trouble. But by Allah's grace and mercy, the scholars are there, have been there, and remain to be there, and will remain, insha'Allah, uh, to provide the ummah with the information and with the usul and the fundamental principles through which they can understand the deen. Because one may read a hadith in Bukhari or an ayah in the book of Allah and come up with all kinds of erroneous conclusions based on not understanding the deen at a, you know, in general or um, in a wholesome understanding. It is a deficient understanding on, based on the person's deficiency in his understanding himself and the fact that he's only looking at some texts without the others. Very critical thing. Because of that, the ulama have divided hypocrisy into two kinds. I'tiqadi wa amali. I'tiqadiyun wa amaliyun. Also, the other uh, words used would be akbar and asghar. Just like you have shirkun akbar wa shirkun asghar. So, i'tiqadi meaning pertaining to belief, amali pertaining to deeds and actions. Which, in, in other words, is major and minor hypocrisy. Major and minor hypocrisy. Now, the i'tiqad, i'tiqadi, and nifaq al-i'tiqadi is uh, basically of six kinds. Is of six kinds. And what it means, i'tiqadi meaning the person's aqidah is not that of a Muslim. While outwardly, he displays a Muslim front. Okay, that's the major nifaq. Meaning, in essence, that person doesn't believe in La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah alayhi salam, or as we will see, has some problem with it. Outwardly, however, he is like a, he acts like a regular Muslim. A classic example would be the Shia, as we addressed earlier, before. Because you get this kind of issue with them. Outwardly, he's, he's your brother, supposedly. And inwardly, he's the enemy of the deen and the Quran and the Sahaba and the Sunnah and Ahlul Bayt, everybody. Everybody. He's an enemy of everybody. So... Uh, that is the i'tiqadi. Now listen to this. Six kinds. Number one, belying the messenger completely. Someone who totally rejects the Prophet wasallam, even though they pretend to be Muslims among the masses. Or denying some of what he brought from Allah. As in, those who like to, you know, uh, shopping. Pick and choose. I like this. I take it. I don't like this. I don't take it. Some people have this mentality with the deen of Allah. They think it's a shopping center and they go, and go grab a shopping cart and then choose whatever is suitable for them and the others they will find ways to reject them. This is actually a form of hypocrisy. And if someone truly denies an aspect of the sunnah completely, he has left Islam and he becomes a hypocrite. Thirdly, hating him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you will think that Muslims don't feel this way. Believe it or not, there are so-called Muslims who hate the Prophet Sallallahu And they say, he's just a regular man. Allah only gave him the Qur'an. Your, your thing is the Qur'an. What you should be concerned about is the Qur'an. They will actually object to some of his actions, alayhi salatu wasalam. And I'm speaking about du'at. How do they do so? How do they do so? They do so when they reject a hadith which they know is sahih. However, that hadith conflicts with the kind of Islam they're trying to portray to the people. They're trying to give him a watered down version of the Quran that is uh, of Islam that is based on, uh, you know, peace, 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 peace. And so that anything from the Sunnah which conflicts with this peace, they will reject it outwardly, publicly, in front of the people. That is actually hating what the Prophet ﷺ had brought. And hating his actions, hating his expeditions, Hating the things he did fi sabilillah. Now you got a problem. A serious problem. Or hating some of that which he brought from Allah. As we mentioned, that is the fourth. Fifthly, rejoicing when his deen is struggling. Some people find it entertaining when the Muslims are suffering. And the sixth one is disliking that his deen prevails. When they see that Islam is, on the, uh, is growing, is prospering, is, is you know, spreading. They're not very happy and content. They become worried and concerned. These are the main characteristics now, the six qualities of the major hypocrisy. Al-Nifaq, Al-I'tiqadi. But that doesn't really suffice. Why? Because I haven't quoted any evidence for that. 
No evidence has been cited to support that. This could be a categorization of the ulama that is actually uh, you know, incorrect. So when we give you now some of the descriptions which Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about in the Quran, then it would become evident and clear. Because if one still doubts the speech of Allah afterwards, he's got a problem or she's got a problem. We have to have a whole other lecture, not this one. But check this out. First, we should all know that hypocrisy is a serious crime, a serious great crime, and it is worse than kufr. It is worse than just mere kufr. Why? Because uh, the person is actually causing more damage. And Islam looks at those who cause the most damage and they will be given the most punishment. Sahih? Allah says, فَوَرَبِّكَ لَنَحْشُرَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Afwan, in the one in Surah Maryam. فَوَرَبِّكَ لَنَحْشُرَنَّهُمْ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ ثُمَّ لَنُحْدِرَنَّهُمْ حَوْلَ جَهَنَّمَ جِثِيَّ ثُمَّ لَنَنْزِعَنَّ مِنْ كُلِّ شِيَعَةٍ أَيُّهُمْ أَشَدُّ عَلَى الرَّحْمَانِ عِتِيَّ After Allah Azza wa says, and Allah swore, by your Lord and Master, we shall gather all of them around Jahannam Jithiyah on their knees. The kuffar and the munafiqeen, obviously. ثُمَّ لَنَنْزِعَنَّ مِنْ كُلِّ شِيَعَةٍ أَيُّهُمْ أَشَدُّ عَلَى الرَّحْمَانِ عَتِيَةٍ Then we shall extract from the many groups that exist there those who were the most severe in going against Allah. The most severe in causing harm to the Ummah. These will be picked out and given a special punishment on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So the hypocrite causes this kind of damage because he is in front of you with you while he is actually plotting against you. Whereas a disbeliever, you already know his stance in regards to you. You know where he stands, he knows where you stand. There isn't really a conflict in this sense. But the hypocrite is way more dangerous and his punishment was mo way more severe. Subsequently, Allah says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ Verily, inna, by the way, when it comes in a sentence, it's for tawkid, it's for emphasis. Allah is emphasizing this. The munafiqeen, the hypocrites, fit darkil asfal. As you know, Jahannam has different levels. The, the, the deeper, the more severe the punishment. The deeper you go, the more severe the punishment. So they will be in the lowest level of the hellfire. Which means that their punishment will be the most severe. Believe it or not, above them will be Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, and you know, other people that are, you know, blatant disbelievers, but the munafiqeen will be beneath all of them because of the seriousness of that crime. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that they're always planning uh, deceit and plots, although outwardly they appear to be with the believers, inwardly they are with the kuffar. Allah Azza wa Jal said, مُذَبْذَبِينَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ لَا إِلَهَا أُولَاءِ وَلَا إِلَهَا أُولَاءِ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلِ اللَّهُ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُ سَبِيلًا They, they are swaying between this and that. They go a little bit with the, uh, with the Muslims and then they go with the kuffar. Belonging neither to these nor to those. They can't really find one side to stick with. Because if they were to say that they are with the Muslims all the way, then they will af be afraid that they will displease the kuffar. And if they were to say that they were the kuffar all the way, then we, they would become evident for the Muslims that these are not Muslims, they're hypocrites. And so the only solution is to do nifaq, which has to do with the word nafaq. It's like a tunnel. So they're trying to be in the tunnel, you know, they, if they make it out of this way and that way. They're trying to please both sides. They're trying to entertain both parties, making everybody happy. Uh, and Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he whom Allah sends astray, you will not find for him a way to the truth. Surah An-Nisa, ayah 4, obviously Surah 4, 143. Uh, listen, because of the corruption of their hearts, the hypocrites are the most averse of mankind to the religion of Allah. Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَإِلَى الرَّسُولِ رَأَيْتَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يَصُدُّونَ عَنْكَ صُدُودًا and when it is said to them, come to what Allah has sent down and to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you see the hypocrites turn away from you with aversion. It's not like they only turn away from you, they turn away from you while 
speaking against you, attacking you, belittling you, defaming you, and doing all things which they can do. They don't just go away with peace. Because some people turn away with peace. قَالُوا سَلَامًا خلاص, this is a jahil. I'm not going to waste my time with them. They say a word of peace and they take and they leave. No, they don't do that. And as we will see in the other qualities they have, they must make a big deal out of it. They must make a big deal. They want to turn away from Allah and His Messenger. So you deliver a lecture, they, they hear a khutbah, uh, someone reminds them of an ayah or a hadith, which conflicts with their choices, and you become the enemy of the state. You become a criminal, you become... And we will see, I'll give you some examples and things which have been, you know, alhamdulillah, undergoing in recent times. It's just amazing. It's an awakening experience uh, to see the reality of the world. I guess we have been deceived or, or we thought we weren't deceived, but we're still deceived. Because you be people's true colors only appear at the times of conflict. That's when you know who's your friend and who's not. And who is moderate and who's not. And who is uh, sincere and who's not. All this becomes evident you know, when, uh, you know, when you're tested. When you're tested, when people are tested. The dealing of the hypocrites revolve around their own interests. When they meet the believers, they make a show or a belief. Uh, that, and loyalty, that's how they pretend. In order to deceive the believers uh, as an action of dissimulation, hoping for whatever good and war booty they have. But when they meet their masters and chiefs, they say, we are with you in your shirk and kufr. Allah says concerning them, وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَى شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا, إنا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ اللَّهُ يَسْتَهْزِئُ بِهِمْ وَيَمُدُّهُمْ فِي طُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ Surah Al-Baqarah <coughs> Ayat 14 and 15 And when they meet those who believe, they say We believe But when they are alone with the shayateen, their devils and polytheists and hypocrites They say truly we are with you, we were only mocking Mocking the believers Allah mocks at them and gives them increase in their wrongdoing to wander blindly. And so this is a common feature. They want to make everybody happy. And so this video, this one clip, one minute clip goes viral about Merry Christmas. You know, I don't know if you've seen it or not. But uh, it has caused a lot of confusion in recent times. Uh, there's a video that once somebody asked in one of the lectures, I think it's Facebook can make you face sell in the Q&A session What is the ruling on saying Merry Christmas? And I gave a short brief answer to my Muslim audience My Muslim audience that Merry Christmas is haram even if an alien came and this and that and it's shirk and it's kufur It's worse than fornication and you know killing someone all this and, and, and amazingly the Christians got a hold of this lovely little clip and this thing went all over the place Christian forums I've been, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, and I'm, I will give you some, some reminders for myself and for you in this regard. Uh, uh, you know, they, I've been attacked on all fronts from the Christians with the foulest language that a human being can use. I mean, if you've lived in the, in the ghetto before, if you've mixed with the gangsters and, and the people in the hood, I don't think they used, and I did, they didn't use this kind of language. They were a little more respectful than these, you know, 50-year-old, uh, you know, businessmen, rich individual who will come to my YouTube channel to leave me a very nasty comment after saying Merry Christmas, even though I don't want anyone to say to me Merry Christmas, along with other foul language, things which you usually learn from pornography. People who watch porn all day, the only language which comes to mind are things related to porn. So they display this kind of language in their commentary, claiming that they are, these are civilized people. We're barbaric, we are the ones this and that, attacking the Prophet ﷺ, attacking Allah, attacking Islam, while they can't even follow their own religion, which teaches them to turn the other cheek and love their enemy. So they neither love their enemy, nor did they turn the other cheek. Rather, they were just, you know, it was venom. And things of this sort. But what is sad? You want to know what's sad? What's sad is when there's a video like that on a Christian channel, YouTube channel, and you read a comment by a Muslim who says, This idiot, this is the Muslim showing you the, mashallah, this idiot up there is not entitled to speak on behalf of Muslims. I pray, I pay zakah, I fast Ramadan. I do this. He is a shame and disgrace for Islam. He is in blah blah other cursing. This is a Muslim. Ya akhi, 
Ya akhi, if you had a brain, if you had a brain, you would have kept your mouth shut. If you think I am crazy, fair enough. Why would you make us Muslims look bad now in front of these individuals? Or if you disagreed, you could have said, you know, I, I disagree with this Muslim up here. Okay, I have a, 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 you know, a different position. Use yani, respectful language. But when you come and you curse out your Muslim brother on a Christian YouTube channel, what good did you do us? Besides, show us your hypocrisy and your hypocritical behavior. And so this is a classic example. They want to make them happy, so they wind up defaming the Muslims. And if he were to come to my, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, you know, for the da'wah or the thing, probably will use a little nicer language. But over there, to make him happy, say what you like. And this is not one person, two people, this is a lot. In fact, Muslims now are sending me emails saying, you're, you're dumb and Merry Christmas to you. Ya Sheikh! Yani, is it to, to this level you are, you, what do you want? Now you just to rub it in my face, now a Muslim wants to say Merry Christmas. Ya Subhanallah, yani, the level of carelessness that some Muslims have is, is just amazing. No consideration whatsoever for others. But you know, if you have been uh, attacked, or, or let me remind myself of you, when you go into the field of da'wah, as they say, if you work for da'wah, and you don't have any enemies, something is wrong in your da'wah. If you don't create enemies, there's something wrong in your da'wah, it's not right. Because you can't be better than the prophets and the messengers, they had plenty of enemies. So having enemies is, is a normal consequence of giving da'wah. Now you get sad, like I get sad. You can probably tell with my uh, appearance and facial expressions that I'm not the happiest individual on earth when Muslims behave this way, or even the non-Muslims, because we want everybody to go to paradise. But they're, they're making it very difficult for themselves to go to paradise. The good news is, we are the winners. If you get attacked fi sabilillah, you will come on yawm al qiyamah, inshallah, with their good deeds. Let them say you're this, and let them say you're that. All this that they, they backbite you and they speak against you for no valid reason, not doing an intellectual refutation for evidence, he is wrong because the Prophet ﷺ said, that may not be backbiting, it's clarifying the position. Or that he's deviant, so be careful, that's fine, as we have done sometimes. But just for the sake of it, let these people know. I advise every Muslim and Muslima who listen to this in the future, do not give your good deeds to the people giving da'wah, don't. Don't think this is gonna go, uh, is gonna go unnoticed by Allah. Wallahi, the angels write it down. Wallahi, every bad word you use will be against you yawm al-qiyamah, and it may be the very word that will send you to Jahannam. And it is up to me and those other individuals to say, Oh Allah, we forgive them, or we say we want our right. Give me your good deeds, because we may need them more than anyone else. <coughs> Don't play games with this stuff. Know your limits. Don't say anything which will cause you a, a major a conflict on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Either say that which is good or keep quiet. Don't, you don't agree with someone? No problem. No one is imposing on you every position. We understand this flexibility. There's room for difference of opinion. But you have to also adhere to the Sunnah in this regard. Differ according to the principles of differing in Islam. Not just attacks against someone because that is a quality of hypocrisy, wallah. It is a shame that a Muslim will defame another Muslim to make a bunch of Christians happy. It just doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen. Ala kulli hal. Allah Azza wa Jal further says uh, that the hypocrites, they actually mock the believers. And they, uh, Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَاء and when it is said to them, believe as the people of the followers of Muhammad وسلم, believe, they say, shall we believe as the fools have believed? So uh, that's why you find that if you were teaching the Aqidah of Tawheed after being labeled as a Wahhabi, the very next consequence or, or uh, a byproduct is that you're a fool. And you're a kafir because you say that Allah has a face and Allah has hands, even though you're just going by the textual evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah. And similarly, all these groups which wind up differing with Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, 
Not only that they differ, but they really consider us to be fools. And they say, you want us to believe like these fools believe? The same thing the hypocrite said about the Sahaba or the Prophet ﷺ, who you better believe, believed in the Quran and the Sunnah as per the apparent meaning of the ayat. Never ever did they interpret an ayah in a way which was not according to the text. They accepted everything Allah said about Himself, everything the Prophet ﷺ said about Allah in the Quran and the Sunnah. They believed it. So when you say that what we're believing in is foolish and that we are fools, you are actually saying that the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ are fools. Guess what? You have predecessors in that. You have predecessors who have already beat you to this kind of uh, allegation. The hypocrites at the time of the Prophet ﷺ themselves. That was their manhaj. So be careful of following that manhaj. Because that manhaj will send you to Jahannam. Um, among the characteristics are enmity and envy towards the believers. Allah says, "In tusibka hasana tun tasuhum." Subhanallah. Wa in tusibka musiba tu yaqulu qad akhadna amrana min qabl wa yatawalla wa hum farihun. If good befalls you, it grieves them. But if a calamity overtakes you, they say we took our precaution beforehand and they turn away rejoicing. So if, listen to this, if good befalls you, it grieves them. And so this morning, a brother from the UK sent me a link to a, a, a page uh, which has already, now the, you know, you've been attacked by the Shia, by the, uh, the Shia have already threatened me by the way, threatened uh, a, an official threat by a, a lady from the UK, you know, and with, with, you know, she said that the video is this and that, and she gave an official uh, threat. I don't know if she notarizes from the from the embassy over there to make it really official But I don't think she got that far. But anyways, that is already cooking. That's already cooking Then of course you have the Shia who don't like us at all And then you have all the more, you know, the Ash'aris and the Mu'tazila and all But no, we also get attacked by the people who claim to be, you know, the Sunnah The people of the Sunnah, those who are supposedly following the way of the righteous predecessors as Salaf al-Salih Who really have deviated in this regard And so they have their own a piece of information to say as well. And the brother said, I, I, you know, I know these individuals, Akhi, it's envy. They have a small channel, no one pays attention to them. They see someone who may be uh, you know, proclaiming the da'wah and the people are actually benefiting from that. And so it, be, it grieves them that you are actually uh, uh, prospering, that the sunnah is being prevailed, not through them. They, don't, they want the sunnah, we, do not, we don't doubt that. They want the sunnah, but it must be through their channel. It must be through their sect. If you try to give it to the people in a name other than their name, no, that's not going to be good for them. It grieves them. It grieves them, so they, they, they lie against you. They lie against you. Allah knows that they're lying, and they know that they're lying. But to them it's halal, because you're not doing it in their name. And so they become envious, it grieves them when something good happens instead of being happy that, that the sunnah is being proclaimed, that the sunnah is being taught, that aqeedat ahl sunnah wal jama'ah is being maintained. Ignore the differences or the little minor issues which we differ on, fair enough, we're going to differ, we cannot agree on everything. But as long as that differing is in regards to issues that don't affect our aqeedah, you need to understand that this is an individual whom you should work with, and, and, uh, and not someone who you should make your very clear enemy. Now listen to this. Among the characteristics is the mockery of Allah, His Messenger and His religion. Allah says, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ لَيَقُولُنَّ إِنَّمَا كُنَّا نَخُودُ وَلَلْعَبُ قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ If you ask them about this, they mock the deen. They mock the beard. They mock the pants above the ankles. They mock the siwak at times. You know, they say, you know, why, why can't you just use a toothbrush? Well, I use a toothbrush, akhi, but I also use the siwak. And who told you that if you use the toothbrush, you have to throw away the siwak? Or if you have the siwak, you have to throw away the toothbrush? You can br Don't look at my teeth now, okay? <laughs> I'll hide them. I'll speak like this. What I'm saying is you can use both. These are actually subtle sometimes. They're subtle. They make fun of aspects of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, whether they pay attention to that or not. But the issue is that Allah said, when it is said to them, you know, when, it, when they confronted with this, they say, we were only talking idly. This was idle talk and joking. Allah did not accept this justification. Allah did not approve of this claim or this excuse. He said to them, say, meaning, O Muhammad ﷺ, say to them, was it at Allah 
at his ayat, proofs, evidences, verses, lessons, signs, revelation, etc. And his messenger that you were mocking, make no excuse, you disbelieved after you had believed. So per the ayah, Allah declared their apostasy upon making fun of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in any aspect of it. So when someone says, you deviant, you know, low life, how can you say, where's Allah? How can you ask this question, where's Allah? Let this person know that the first one who asked this was the Prophet ﷺ as in a hadith in Sahih Muslim. So when you make fun of this particular question, you have actually made fun of the Prophet ﷺ who asked the very question to the slave girl, Ain Allah. So you need to realize that you may be falling into an act of disbelief by mocking something from the sunnah while thinking that you're not. But Allah said that this is not going to be good. So the people have to be aware of the, what, you know, what results of the statements. Some are very grave. So when it comes to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Ya Akhwan, either we are able to adhere to it, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, or we admit our shortcomings. That's the only other option. Say, yes, I know it's a sunnah, I just can't do it. I'm unable to do it. I'm weak, I, 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 need, I ask Allah to, to guide me and, and aid me. But to turn around and belittle it and make fun of it because you can't carry it out, that's very dangerous. And that's a sign of hypocrisy. Anyways, Allah said they are known for spreading corruption in the earth. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمْ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ When it is said to them, do not cause corruption upon earth. They say, no, we are only those who are trying to rectify things. We're trying to do good. Allah said, verily it is they who are making mischief, and, but they perceive not. So they are known for spreading fitna and spreading corruption upon earth. And putting things that shouldn't be put on their Facebook pages, on their YouTube channels. Many of the people that actually criticize you, if you go to his YouTube channel, you find uh, all you see is music and, and half-naked women dancing. And earlier he was cursing you out, you're not supposed to be speaking about Islam, and you don't know what you're talking about. Then you go to his channel and he's got all these naked women dancing on his, on his main page. So are you supposed to be talking about Islam, Akhi? Are you the representative now? At least have some... Some respect and remove this junk which you have on your, on your channel before you go and attack others. Again, the reason why I'm repeating this because it's, it's been happening often and the people need to know what they're doing. And they need to know that this is, uh, goes hand in hand with hypocrisy. All of these are qualities of hypocrisy which we should be very, very careful of. Anyways, the, the ayat are actually many. Uh, and I will, be, I will have to skip some of them, we're almost done, but I, I want to go to the actual narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which further uh, clarify this particular issue. Now, before I do so, let me share with you an interesting event that happened at the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Hanzala. Do you guys know Hanzala? Tayyib. Hanzala narrates, he said, I met uh, Abu Bakr. And said, how are you? and he said to me, How are you, Hamdala? I said, Hamdala has become a hypocrite. Hamdala has become a hypocrite. He said, Subhanallah, what are you saying? I said, Hamdala speaking, when, when we are with the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he reminds us of the fire and the garden, as in Jannah, until it is as if we are seeing them with our own eyes. But when we depart from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we attend to our wives and children and businesses, earning a living. And we forget a great deal. We forget. Abu Bakr said, by Allah we experience something similar. This is Abu Bakr Siddiq, the best of this ummah after the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was called a Siddiq because of the level of truthfulness and because of the level of belief and certainty he had in the deen. Yet he was telling, Hanzala, we share the same sentiments. We feel the same way. So they, be, they both went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Hanzala said, he said, Hanzala uh, said to the Prophet Sallallahu Hanzala has become a hypocrite. O Messenger of Allah. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, why is that? I said, O Messenger of Allah, when we are with you, you remind us of the fire and Jannah. 
until it is as if we are seeing them with our own eyes. But when we depart from you, we attend to our wives and children and businesses and we forget a great deal. The, now listen, this is the good news because otherwise we will all be in big trouble, man. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, by the one in whose hand is my soul. If you continued as you were, I'm sorry, if you continued as you are when you are with me and continue to remember paradise and hell, the angels would shake hands with you in your homes and on the streets. Yeah, and you would become so righteous that the malaika will actually shake hands with you at home and on the streets. But, oh, alhamdulillah, there's a time for this and a time for that. There's a time for this and a time for that. There's a time for this and a time for that. He repeated it three times in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. So that shows you, if anything, the, the reality of the iman of the Sahaba and how much they feared for themselves. And this hadith is glad tidings for every believer who fails at times once he mixes with the dunya because mixing in the dunya and trying to earn a living and spending time with your family and wife or children is inevitable. And one may think that if I listen to a lecture, I, my heart softens and I feel good, and then I go back home and I'm going back to the old things, I'm a total hypocrite. Well, no. Because you cannot possibly be righteous in this, in this thinking always about Jannah and Jahannam. You can't. This does not mean, however, that we get comfortable or that we deliberately, uh, you know, uh, try to benefit at the time of the lecture, then deliberately go against what we heard when we go back out. Because that becomes hypocrisy. See, we have to be concerned. The most important thing is being concerned that am I one of them? And we will see some of the statements of the Sahaba uh, and the Tabi'een in this regard. Uh, or we should see it very soon. For example, someone said this to Imam Ahmad. And he said, can anyone not worry about nifaq? Can anyone possibly stop worrying that he is actually a hypocrite? It is abnormal for you not to worry. You should worry about this around the clock. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, rahimahullah, said every time I presented myself before the Quran, I found myself to be insincere. Anytime meaning I measured my, my conduct according to the Quranic standards, I found myself to be a hypocrite and insincere. And so when you read the Quran and you read the believers in the Mu'minun Alladina Ida Dukir Allahu Wajulat Wajilat Kulubuhum Waida Tuliat Alayim Ayatu Zadatum Imana Ila Akhri Ayat. Qad aflah al Mu'minun Alladina Humfi Salatim Khashirun Waila Akhri. Then you look at yourself and say, Hey, where am I? Wa Ibadu Rahman in Ladina Yam Shuna Ala Al Ardi Hawan and Waida Khatabah Humul Jahiluna Kalu Salama Ila Akhri Ayat. If you read the description of Ibadu Rahman, you will find that maybe we have one. Huh? Which one? Illa man taba wa amana wa amila amalan salihan. That's the only one we can do, repent to Allah and try to make it up. Otherwise, where, where are those praying all night? And where are those who are walking on earth with humbleness? And where are those who avoid shirk and avoid zina and avoid killing the soul which Allah made haram? And where are those who la yashadun azur? They don't bear witness and witness any falsehood, including non-Muslim festival, festivals and celebrations. Where are they? Where are those who are making dua to be the imam of the Muslim as opposed to being the, uh, the most qualified doctor in a particular location? Where are they? وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامَ قُرَّةَ عَيُّ The children, they want them to be the pleasure of the eye. Where are they? Instead of worrying about international school or regular school, which is fine. But where is the Islamic element though? Where is that, that, that thought about the children making sure they go to Jannah and go to Jahannam? Who observes his children when they drink with the left hand or the right hand and makes, makes, it, makes sure that they're notified and taught? That when they put on new clothing, they make the dua for the new clothing. That they begin with the right foot when they put on their shoes. And they begin with the left when they take them off. You will find that many parents themselves don't apply this, let alone teaching their children. So if we were to measure ourselves per the Quran, we will lose big time. And so... That means we should worry a lot. But I'll tell you something else. There are things which are a lot more practical. And there are other qualities of hypocrisy, those of the minor hypocrisy, or al-amali, 
النفاق العملي Listen to this hadith from the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم أربع أربع من كنا فيه كان منافقا خالصا ومن كان فيه خصلة منهن كانت فيه خصلة نفاق حتى يدعها إذا اتمن خان وإذا حدث كذب وإذا عاهد غدر وإذا خاسم فجر The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said there are four traits Whoever possesses them is a hypocrite, a pure 100% hypocrite. And whoever possesses some has an element of hypocrisy until he leaves it. Pay attention now. When he speaks, he lies. When he promises, he breaks his promise. When he disputes, he transgresses. And when he makes an agreement, he violates it. There are other wordings of the hadith, because the hadith is in Bukhari, in Muslim, in Nasai, a number of uh, actually collections of a hadith. In the other wording, it says, the signs of the hypocrite are three. When he speaks, he lies, that is common with the one I quoted now. When he promises, he breaks his promise, that is common with the one I quoted now. This one has an additional one, when he is entrusted, he betrays the trust, or he is treacherous. In another hadith in Muslim, an additional wording, even if he prays and fasts and claims that he's a Muslim, as long as he has these qualities, even if he fasts and he prays and he says, I'm a Muslim, he is munafiq, khalis nifaq. Khalis nifaq. Pure hypocrite. Now let's deal with them one at a time. And brothers and sisters, let's be frank with each other because you know, sometimes we deceive ourselves and deceiving oneself is hypocrisy. It is hypocrisy to deceive oneself. So let's be real and see to what extent are we free from these and how often do we fall into them so we can be careful, more careful and more cautious. When he speaks, he lies. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْكَذِبِ فَإِنَّ الْكَذِبَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْفُجُورِ وَإِنَّ الْفُجُورَ يَهْدِي إِلَى النَّارِ وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَيَكْذِبَ لَيَكْذِبُ وَيَتَحَرَّ الْكَذِبَ حَتَّى يُكْتَبُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَذَّابًا Woe to you in regards to lying. Because lying leads to immorality and obscene behavior. And that kind of behavior will lead you to the hellfire. And really a man will lie and continue to find means to lie until he is written with Allah as a liar. How often do we lie? We made it late to work, but we say that we made it on time. Or we do something which contradicts the etiquettes and the ethics of work and when we are confronted we lie how often do we actually lie against actu actually uh, lie against muslims lie against muslims if you go and read the forms these islamic forms illa man rahim allah they're full of lies full of lies against the people they lie against everyone that they feel it is okay to lie against. And that will lead to Jahannam. And that is a trait of hypocrisy. So the Muslim does not lie. And the worst kind of lying, ya akhwan, is the one in da'wah. Wallahi, nothing, nothing, uh, uh, you know, uh, pains, nothing really causes pain and agonizes the heart as much as seeing a da'iyah lying. Lying before the people for whatever reason. Specifically those engaging in debates. It is very sad that a Muslim will have to stand before the crowd and lie until the person whom he's debating with has to comment afterwards, say, look, you know that this is not true and you know that all the Muslims who are present in this debate do not agree with you because you're lying against the deen. That's the form, worst kind of lying. 
The second quality, when he promises, he breaks his promise. Hello. This is the most common, disgusting feature that has become so prevalent, it's ridiculous. And there was a special khutbah, khutbah delivered on this topic, and I wish I can deliver it with that same enthusiasm. Because now I'm, I'm giving a lecture and I can't speak in that same manner, y'all will run away. But really, it is, dis it is sad, man. People do not understand what it entails when he says, when he promises you something and he doesn't fulfill it, exempt, exemption, those who are excused. Forgetfulness is an excuse. Or inability is another excuse. رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِنَّ نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا وَلَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسَعَى Let us set these aside. What I'm speaking about now is not when you are unable because of inability, it's beyond your scope, not because you forgot, because you're excused for forgetfulness. And not when someone forces you against your will. Once we set these three aside, brother, what have you been doing in regards to your appointments? I'll see you at 5 o'clock. You call him at 5.45, says, I'm home. I'm home. Our appointment was 5. 5 o'clock. No, not only that person doesn't come on time. No, that person cannot manage to send an SMS. Even though today sending an SMS has become so easy. You have swipe. You know, if you use swipe, you don't even have to move your finger off the keyboard on your smartphone, if it is smart. You just go like this. I'm sorry. I'm running late. It takes you approximately 10 seconds depending on how experienced you are in writing text messages. Some people do it with the old standard phone, you know. Tick, 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 tick. Still they can manage to send it in a minute. No, but see, the people don't care. If they cared, they would have done so. But now listen to this. In the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal was praising the prophets. He was speaking about the prophets and the qualities and the traits in Surah Maryam. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ Maryam, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِلَىٰ أَخْرِهِ Until he said, until he said, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَاعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّةِ and mentioned in the book Ismail. What was the main thing Allah chose to speak about? To praise Ismail. Ismail is the one who put his neck to be slaughtered. Fi sabil Allah. Ismail, what do you know about Ismail? What are we going to say about Ismail? Ya abati if'al ma tu'mar. Satajiduni insha'Allah min al-sabirin. Telling his father, do whatever you, you're commanded. The Ismail is the one who built the Kaaba. From all of these fada'il and virtues which he had, Allah said two things about him. One, innahu kana sadiq al wa'd He was truthful in his promise. And the other thing, kana rasul al nabiya He was a messenger and a prophet. Which means only one thing was mentioned about Ismail. He kept his promise. Some people think it is not important. But it is very important. The scholars say, he breaks his promise in one of two ways. Either when he tells you, yes, he gives you the okay, while he intends, he knows at that moment that he's not going to fulfill it. That's one form of lying and breaking the promise, and that brings two calamities. First he lied, said, abshir, abshir. And he knows that there's no abshir involved. Inshallah. And he knows that there's nothing after that. So he lies and he promises at the moment of speaking, or... After he gives you the word, initially he had the determination, then he changes his mind and he still betray, he still breaks the promise. Which is less of a crime, but it is still a crime. So my Muslim brothers and sisters, for the sake of Allah, from this day onwards, you have to understand these appointments, these promises which you give to the people are part of our deen. It is part of your aqidah. It is not something that is worldly, so that you're not held accountable for it, you will be held accountable for it. You will be held accountable. Listen to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hadith Anas. He said, لا إيمان لمن لا أمانة له ولا دين لمن لا عهد له There is no true faith for the one who is, does not have honesty. The one who lacks honesty, he does not really have iman. And then there's no religion, there's no religious commitment for the one who has no promise. 
the one who just runs his mouth, Abshir, tomorrow I will do it, no problem. And he knows he is not going to do anything. So from now onwards, when you tell someone you will meet them at 5 o'clock, you will call them at 5 o'clock unless you forgot. And now we have means not to forget. You have a calendar, you have a pen, you have a paper, you have a secretary, whatever you have. You have to utilize the means before you say, I forgot. Unless you forgot. Or unless something happened beyond your ability, you got in a car accident, there was an accident, so you were delayed. Malish, it happens. Or unless you, uh, uh, you know, it's beyond your ability to do it, then we're not excused. And we are actually, we are actually qu carrying a quality of hypocrisy as long as we keep telling the people things which we do not do. So, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that the disbelievers take this matter way more seriously than Muslims for the sake of the dunya. You won't find someone in the business meeting telling people I'll meet you at 5 o'clock and then not show up. Or call them half an hour later and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm running late. They will make sure that they will tell them ahead of time what happened to them which will prevent them from showing up on time. Because they think this is something that is out of respect to the other person's time. At the end of the day, people have time. People have time. The people call you during Salah. You're in the masjid? You're in the masjid. You answer the phone? Yes, yes brother. So, brother, I'm sorry, you're sleeping? No, brother, it's, I'm, are you in Jeddah? Yes. It's Salah time, man, I'm in the masjid. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, uh, okay. I'll call you back after Salah. Brother, I'm going to be busy. Half an hour after the Salah, I'm going to be busy. So please make sure you call me within that half an hour. Yes, brother. Never calls back. Never calls back. Never sends a message. Nothing. Khalas, you hear from him once? And that's the end of it. Wallahi, not once. Wallahi, over 50 times this happened to me. I'm speaking about myself. So that you will not think I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this from home or from some outside sources. My own experience. Brother, what happened to you? At least call back. Send a message. Sorry, I got busy. Some of them, when they call back, say, Akhi, what happened? Say, oh yeah, brother, you know. Yeah. And then he goes, I have a question. Say, but I need an answer. Brother, why? You know, why? What, the time of people is valuable, man. I don't think I'm just sitting, sitting there at home, you know, with a fan like this, you know, or I'm looking for flies to swat. Oh, there's one. Hello, yes, brother. Any questions you have, please ask. Sheikh, I have, people have a life. You can be playing games with them, calling them, well, stick to a time. I'm saying this not just to anyone, any Muslim with any Muslim. No one is sitting there doing nothing. People have a life to live. Out of respect for their time and their time, when you tell him you'll meet him at 5 o'clock, yeah, maybe at 5 or 5, he has something important. Maybe he canceled an event for you. So when you come so late, you ruin both your event and his event. These are things we have to be considerate in regards to the other people. Yeah, and it's minimum, minimum requirement. I'm sure you can do it. We just have to remember that, inshallah. In the hadith of Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu anhu ardah, the Prophet sallallahu said in a hadith which was uh, authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani, awfu idha wa'attum. Fulfill the promise when you promise. Subhanallah, hadith is explicit. Awfu idha wa'attum. Fulfill when you promise. I'm showing you this is deen. This is deen. It's not something else. Thirdly, when he disputes, he transgresses. What does that mean? He will go away from the truth deliberately until he makes a truth falsehood and a falsehood truth. Yani they exaggerate and overreact. When you dispute with them, they, they blow things out of proportion. Out of proportion. So you will find, who has been coming to these lectures for at least two years? Or three years? Anyways, we have been doing this by Allah's grace, alhamdulillah. And inshallah we will continue if Allah allows it. For a good three, four years now. Believe it or not, we have discussed almost everything you can imagine that we Muslims need on a daily basis. Aqeedah, Salah, the, the conditions of La ilaha illallah, the conditions of Muhammad Rasulullah, description of Jannah, description of the hellfire, the life in the grave, the Aqeedah of Al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, you name it, you name it. Now from among these, I don't know how many lectures, they, let's say 60 to 70, there are four or five lectures where some individuals had to be publicized just to warn the Muslims against their possible danger. And so you go to these forums, and what do the people write? The only thing he talks about is other people. Is this, is this fair? 
Don't you think Allah will hold you accountable for that statement? My brother, if you ever watch this, don't you think Allah will hold you accountable for lying? Is this the only thing we do? We can count on our fingers the individuals mentioned for a very good reason. Otherwise, we're trying to bring a reminder to myself and everybody else in regards to things which will get it closer to Allah and take us to Jannah. We don't take this as a business of trying to fetch for people's mistakes. But wallahi, more than once the same, not just about me, any, any of those involved in da'wah to the sunnah, when the Sufis and the, those who are against the sunnah, when they want to kind of dismiss the truth which is being presented, they say he's only, he only does this, he only does that. So the latest thing I said, he's a typical Salafi from London. I'm a typical Salafi from London. I've never been to London. It just, people just throw statements out like this. You know, said, wow, you know, I'm a Salafi. I didn't know I was a Salafi. And what do you mean by Salafi? Which Salafi do you mean? The Salafi or the Salafi? You know what I'm saying? Because we have a, new, a number of Salafis out there. We have the, the sect member. And we have the one who follows the methodology. And we understand that there are these two groups out there. Well, the other one, we don't really call it a group because it's really too large to be uh, restricted to some websites and some individuals. But, you know, the, all these, this is just, you know, allegations, lies. This is a form of trying to twist the truth into falsehood just to scare the people away from the truth. So, Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab, rahimahullah, became the enemy of Islam because he told the people to go back to La ilaha illallah. And those who follow this way became Wahhabis because they're telling the people La ilaha illallah. And they lie. They know that they're lying. And this is a form of إِذَا خَاصَمَ fajr. When he disputes, he transgresses against the boundaries. He does not follow justice. We have to be very careful brothers and sisters in Islam. And lastly, when he makes an agreement, he violates. Yani you will start some business transaction with each other and next thing you know, he's out the door. And a brother was telling me yesterday some crazy things. This one, uh, one brother, he married this one woman. Okay? And then uh, they had a problem with her father. Eventually, uh, after they fought with the father, the husband and the father, his father-in-law, they, they made up. So the father said, look, you know, uh, why don't we do business together? The guy said, he's trying to be kind. He said, yeah, no problem, what do you want? He said, real estate. We'll buy land will make money. He said, okay, what do you need? He said, give me money. He said, okay, he gave him money. He said, what else? He said, give me wakala. Make me يعني, a representative, a legal representative on your behalf. He said, no issue. He gave him that. The guy took the money. Okay, the guy took the money and he bought one land, eventually sold it. They made a little money. The guy, the, the, the son-in-law gave the father-in-law his portion of the, of the profit. Then he bought another land. And then they fought again. What went with the fighting? What was lost with the fighting? The land. It's in his name. He has wakala. Take it back if you're a man. Take it back if you're a man. Yeah, Sheikh. Yani the fear of Allah is gone. How are we going to meet Allah with the whole land? The Prophet ﷺ said, if you take a shibr, if you take a hand span of earth, Allah will make the seven earths, uh, you know, in. in basically cover you up it, you'll be immersed in them if you if you steal a, a hand span of land this person is taking a huge land and telling him now take it if you're a man you know you're gonna divorce my daughter you're gonna have this take the land if you can now, this is a classic example so when they give you when they make an agreement they will eventually violate it lastly even though there are many qualities, there's one which I really want to give a few minutes. I'm still within my time uh, constraints and limitations. The one which is most devastating, the quality of the hypocrites which we should all make sure we don't have, is the one where Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلَا يَأْتُونَ الصَّلَاةَ إِلَّا وَهُمْ كُسَالًا In another ayah Allah said, وَإِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَامُوا كُسَالًا يُرَاؤُونَ النَّاسَ وَلَا يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And they do not come to salah except in the state of laziness. In another ayah Allah says, And those who when they go, when they want to establish the salah, they only establish it in the state of laziness, 
trying to show off before the people and they only remember Allah but little. They remember Allah but little. And how often do you see that in ourselves today? This happens on different fronts. It happens when the adhan is being called and you're not making sure you're in the masjid because you're lazy. Not that you're, you have a valid excuse. The valid excuse isn't a valid excuse. But some people are just too lazy. They just like to re recline longer on the couch even though they know that the adhan has been called. Same thing goes for the iqama. Same thing goes for takbiratul ihram. Same thing goes for uh, you know, joining the first row. And that is the saddest one. If you really want to see, yani if you want to know whether you, my brother, or I have actually fallen into hypocrisy, check yourself. Are you the brother sitting at the back row, leaning against the wall, when you actually are early to the salah? Are you? And are you one of those who hear the iqama has been called? And the people are already standing in the row and you're still looking at them? You haven't been seeing it? Today, when Aisha, we prayed, tomorrow Fajr. Tomorrow Fajr. In the masjid, not to fetch for people's mistakes, I just want to prove it to you. When the Salah Iqam has been called, look to the back. And see how many people are still sitting down when the Salah has already been called. And when, as soon as they come, oh, he's already yawning, Ya Sheikh. And he's walking wallah, as if you are taking him to a jail cell. As if he's being taken to his demis, as if this is the end of his life. You have to push him to go to the salah. And sometimes you tell him, brother, come on, hurry up. He looks at you, yeah, and leave me alone, man. Yeah, I want good news for you, brother. There's a place in the first row. Come, man, we can squeeze you in. No? They say, they say it's okay, they let someone else go. No, you go. Oh, now suddenly, mashallah. Oh, at the door, at the door, he will elbow you. Move, ule, so he can come out. But when it comes for the first row, tfaddal, brother. Tfaddal, no tfaddal. No, wallah, she, she, someone other. No, you tfaddal. Look, this is the time when you should go in, akhi. There's no, there's no time. La ithara fi ta'ad, the ulama say. There's no kind of favoritism. There's no altruism when it comes to acts of worship. And if someone says, would you like to call the adhan? Say, sure. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, don't say ma'alayhi zakallah khair, tfaddal. The ulama say any, any opportunity given for you to get closer to Allah, grab it man. You have a place in the first row, go ahead. Tfaddal. They were now suddenly he became, you know, a philanthropist and an altruist. It's the wrong time. And really if you were, if, if we had the real iman, if we knew the hadith of the Prophet wasalam, in regards to the first row, we will, we will fight for it, ya jama'ah. We will actually crawl on the ground to make it to the first row. We will draw lots to pray in the first row. But th that, the people sitting in the back, chilling, don't realize that. On Jumu'ah, it's the same thing. You find some of the messages, they have a recliner in the front row, and then the recliner, seven, eight rows back. People go sit on that back one, just so he can, uh, he came half an hour, by the way, before the imam. How difficult it is for you to sit for half an hour with your legs crossed and you know, with your back not reclining. It's not a big deal. Unless you're a senior citizen with back problems, any one of us can do it. But the laziness, Akhi, is he's willing to give up all this ajr in the front just so he can sit in the back. Whether the people realize it or not, we're not saying these are hypocrites, but this is a quality of hypocrisy. It is a quality of hypocrisy which we should rid ourselves of. We should free ourselves from completely. We should hasten to the salah and be in the front. At the end, at the end, let us look at the sahaba and their fear. Why did the sahaba fear for themselves hypocrisy? Because they heard Allah say, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they deviated, when they turned away, Allah caused their hearts to turn away. This is the ayah which we should be afraid of. Each and every one of us should be, if, until you meet Allah, this ayah should always be in your mind. If you turn, when, when we turn away, Allah may cause our hearts to turn away. And when our hearts turn away by Allah, no one can bring it back. No one can show us the truth afterwards. No one can guide us to the path afterwards. It's a very serious matter. And that is hypocrisy. When you, are, when you have been deviated from the path while you think you're rightly guided. 
It's a form of hypocrisy. Allah says, وَنُقَلِّبُ أَفْئِدَتَهُمْ وَأَبْصَارَهُمْ كَمَا لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهِ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ وَنَذَرَهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ وَنَذَرُهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ And we shall turn their hearts and their eyes away from guidance as they refuse to believe they're in for the first time. When the truth was presented for the first time and they deliberately turned away from it, Allah will cause the hearts and the eyes to turn away so they don't see the guidance anymore, they don't understand the guidance anymore, and they would fall into the very hypocrisy which the Sahaba feared for themselves. The Sahaba were fearing that these little things that they did, like, like remembering death when with the Messenger of Allah, then being attached to the dunya, not attached, but being concerned with your dunya to some extent when you're with the family, they were afraid that this hypocrisy will lead them to the major hypocrisy. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't worry. There's a time for this and a time for that. But that worry must exist. So let us review our accounts. And let us revisit our behavior. And let us see to what extent do we actually suffer from these qualities, be it the major, i'tiqadi, or amali. And there's time for rectification. Alhamdulillah, that we're alive, we're healthy, inshallah. And if any one of us has deviated in this regard, this is the time to return to Allah and to, to cleanse ourselves from these qualities. Specifically, akhwan, the four of minor. The four minor practices, because these are, alhamdulillah, we believe all the people here are believers. Even the majority of the audience will be actual believers. So many of the qualities which we spoke about earlier that are specific to the me real hypocrites, the major hypocrites may not apply. But these last four, they do. They do. So, you know, in every religion they are hypocrites. Let's not be the hypocrites of Islam. The Christians have showed us their hypocrisy. Turn the other cheek, love the enemy, and then we didn't see any of that. Hypocrisy per their religion. And in Islam, we, we, we also have a group, we have a lot. So let us not be among them or share their traits in any way, shape or form. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to, to cleanse us from these qualities and to make us sincere, righteous slaves who, who strive to make things which are pleasing to him and to do things which are pleasing to him. Verily, he's able to do all things. Any questions? Barakallah um, feekum. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. I'm living in Jeddah. And now going for a short vacation. Do I have to perform tawaf wada'? No. No, you don't. Uh, in India, you live in Jeddah. You're not someone who came for hajj or, or you know, umrah. And so that's, that doesn't apply. In India, the masjid in our area has a grave inside. And people say it is of a religious person. Sure. Passed away many years ago. Can we pray in this masjid where the grave is placed inside? No, you cannot. No, you cannot pray in a masjid where there's a grave. It is haram. And according to some of the ulama, if you do pray there, your salah is batila. Your salah is void and invalid. This is not a place for you to pray. You pray, as Allah says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا The masajid are for Allah alone, so don't call on anyone besides Allah. Why is there a grave there? Because they think that there's a special blessing in that dead person. So all this is a form of shirk. All this is shirk in fact. And so you cannot pray in this masjid. If there are no other masajid around, pray at home. But don't pray in this masjid. As I heard many people saying that the salah cannot be performed in gravest place. Correct. What you heard is actually accurate and correct. Let's do them uh, one by one. Uh, what should one do if one's mother asks her to shape her eyebrows, insisting that it makes her look like a man, even though she doesn't look like a man? And it is clearly uh, forbidden to shape eyebrows. But it is also said that one should obey the parents. And it really upsets the mother if she does not shape them. Well, let me give you the bottom line of it. The bottom line of it is that we have Quranic evidences and traditions from the Prophet ﷺ and logical refutation for this claim. The Quran says, وَإِن جَاهَدَكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا If they struggle... Struggle, not only they, they make, a, they exert all efforts so that you may associate upon it with me. And the ulama understand from that meaning sin, any kind of sin. And Allah here mentioned the worst one. فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Do not obey them. That's Allah telling you, do not obey them. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الطَّاعَةُ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Verily, ta'a is only in regards to that which is acceptable. وَلَا طَاعَةَ لِمَخْلُوقٍ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ He further said, alayhi salam, there's no obedience to a created being if it entails disobeying the Creator. So now you have the Quran and the Sunnah telling you, don't worry. 
even if it's your parents, Allah is telling you don't obey them. Logic says, are, is your mother the one who has the key to Jannah and Jahannam? Does she have the key? She doesn't have the key. So let's give you the hypothetical situation. Okay? If you obey your mother, and Allah is displeased with you and wants to punish you in Jahannam, because it mal'oon, the one, the woman who plucks her eyebrows and shapes them is mal'oona. She's cursed, meaning she's entitled to enter Jahannam. Okay? If Allah wants to put you in Jahannam, can your mother stop Allah from doing that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because she has the key to Jannah? Say, no, no, I'm the one who told her. She can't. But if you were to obey Allah and your mother was disobeyed in the process, and Allah wants to put you in Jannah for this obedience. Can your mom complain and say, no, put her in Jannah because she disobeyed me? No. So with all due respect to the mother, you have to let this one go. You don't disrespect her. You don't treat her you know, in a way that is not becoming. You still have to adhere to the dutifulness to her. Nevertheless, you cannot disobey Allah to make her happy. You explain to her in the same words I'm telling you now. Mom, wallahi, I love you. Wallahi, I know the right that you have over me. But wallahi, I love Allah more. What do you want me to do? You're telling me to conflict with Allah. You, who do you want me to? You want me to obey you against Allah. Allah made me and made you. If I disobey Allah, who guarantees that Allah will keep me for you? What if Allah takes me? And then you have to deal with my death for the rest of your life. Why don't you thank Allah that we're both alive? And let us obey Him so He can, he can make our lives prosper. You want to go against Him, you expect goodness from Allah? So tell her something from the heart. If she has some iman, she will let you go. We hope at least. Some parents, a'udhu billah ya shaykh. A'udhu billah. Is there any way to repent or take back an unreasonable promise ma made in anger? Yeah, you can repent from anything which you have done and you can apologize to the person whom you harmed and ask them to forgive you. Sorry, I betrayed. And if they forgive you, alhamdulillah. And you repent to Allah regardless whether they forgive you or not. And then it below, it's up to Allah. Because promises have to do with people's rights. And people's rights will be dealt with on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But yes, it is possible. And there's no, nothing which even shirk and kufur, you repent, Allah will accept the repentance. So the tawbah, the door of tawbah, Say, oh my slaves who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Verily, Allah forgives all sins. Khalas, it's from Allah Azza wa Jal. Can we do dua while holding the Kaaba, which is in Mecca a lot? You mean the Kaaba is in Mecca a lot? It's there all the time. Or you mean holding the Kaaba a lot? I don't know what you mean, Zakir khair. Nevertheless, um, the asl is that you don't hold the Kaaba. The exception is Al Hajar al Aswad. And what is known as Al Multazam which is that area between the Hajar al-Aswad and the door. However, this issue itself has been a point of difference among the ulama because they only have some athar from the Sahaba which support that action. So they say if you do the Multazam particularly and you are doing it because you believe that the Sahaba did it, you're fine. But any other part of the Kaaba which people do as seeking Barakah is not correct and there's no Barakah in it. Not in the cloth, not in the actual stone, nothing. Otherwise, Dhul Suwaiqitain will not come at the end of time and destroy the Kaaba stone by stone. There's no, no, there's no barakah in the construction itself. You understand? Because the Karamita took the Hajar al Aswad and kept it with them for so long before it was brought back. So the idea is Allah is the one who gives you the barakah. Allah is the source of barakah, not the Kaaba itself. If Allah is displeased with you and you grab the Kaaba, what? Are you going to get the barakah despite of Allah Azza wa Jal? La Allah. No, so this is not from the Sunnah unless it is the Multazim. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Um, I'm getting old. He, there, um, there, is there, okay, is there any such prayer in Islam called Sukriya? It should be, Sukriya is drunk, by the way. Sukr, I know, I know, I know. I have to pick on this one, man. Come on, you know, I wait for these ones. So make sure you make a distinction between the sheen and the seen. Okay, because people say sukran, and sukran is actually saying drunkenness. Okay? <laughs> shukran, however, means thanks. So shukriya prayer, okay, I understand that. Shukriya, and I know this is in uh, that language. Shukriya sadiq. Uh, prayer and gratitude. 
prayer of gratitude. It's, if so, can you please explain the uh, procedure and supplication of this prayer? As far as I know, there's no such thing. What you do have is sujood ash-shukr, the prostration of thankfulness. So if some good news happened to you or Allah blesses you with something, you make an, and the ulama say you don't even have to have wudu, or you don't have to have a sister, a sister, you don't even have to have the hijab per se. You can just you prostrate to Allah and make sajda known as sajda to shukr or the sujood of shukr. As for a salah, there's no such salah. There is no such salah. Now, wallahu alam. Um, we spoke on keeping our promise towards others, to, uh, towards other people. Uh, does that include our family, our families? Please uh, clarify further. Yes, of course. In fact, the, the family is even, they have more of a right. Because breaking the promise with them entails severing the kinship ties along with breaking the promise. So you know in, in Islam, sabaka to the family, to someone whose family will give you double reward and then harming them will give you double sin. Because you've harmed a Muslim and then you've actually caused the kinship ties to be severed. So you have double trouble there. They have more of a right that you fulfill the promises which you give them. Way more of a right. Now, they may be more flexible with you. Alhamdulillah. They may say, Mafi mushkila, you know, we're, we're cousins, we're not, no issues. Uh, but that does not mean that you become negligent and careless as well. So you have a, a, a job to fulfill, then if they want to be more of a pardoning kind of individuals, that's nice of them, to pardon you often no matter how many times you repeat it. Because other people may not really entertain you. After five, six times they'll say, look, you need to take a hike, man. I'm not going to be going out with you anymore because every time you promise me, you just don't fulfill the promise. Yes. I knew it. <laughs> yes, brother. The hadith about it? Okay, well the hadith says لَوْ أَنَّ النَّاسَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا فِي النِّدَاءِ وَالصَّفِّ الْأَوَّلِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَجِدُوا إِلَّا أَنْ يَسْتَهِمُوا عَلَيْهِ لَسْتَهَمُوا عَلَيْهِ If the people only knew what was waiting or what was awaiting them in terms of reward in the first row and in the call of prayer and then they had no choice but to draw lots, they would have drawn lots. What does that mean? That means we will go to the masjid, okay? And we find one vacant spot in the first row. If we really knew the ajr associated with that, we would actually bring a small box and we would put our names in that box and then we will have someone draw out, say, okay, congratulations, Brother Muhammad, you get the first row. And we would do this every single time. If we only knew what was waiting. This is a opposition to what I said earlier, tfaddal. They want tfaddal, but people don't know that. The other hadith, which this is the good news. The scary news is that the hadith says it's sahih, uh, Some people will remain to deliberately ignore the first row until Allah will keep them back in the hellfire. Until Allah will cause their delay to take them to the hellfire. Those who deliberately do not go for the first row. That is a sahih hadith. Authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah. So that shows you that it is not only something you're encouraged to do, it's something you've actually been warned against not doing. So as a man, this is where you need to be. As long as you're able to be there, don't miss out. Never miss out. When you're late for whatever valid reason, then you should feel sad that you missed out on that goodness. But for their natural uh, standard attitude is to miss the first row and there's no big deal, no, that's a, that's a big problem. Now, there's more to it, but this is what can be quoted now. بارك الله فيك